Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Progressive Conservative Summit. My name is Kaylor Sweeney, and I serve as the Common Ground Initiative Program Manager with the Holland Science Center for Presidential Studies here at GVSU. Before we begin, I want to thank our Holland Science Center members for their support, which makes our events, program, our events possible, as well as the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation for their partnership on this program. It is likely that we will hear things today we do not agree with. In fact, it is my sincere hope that we do. Whatever disagreements we may have, I urge us to keep in mind that our collective presence here today is evidence that there is common ground to be found, if only we can find it. I ask that we all practice humility and engage with ideas different from our own with curiosity and respect. We begin our event today with Professor Javed Ali, who will offer us some context going into today's program. Professor Ali is an Associate Professor of Practice at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Ali brings more than 20 years of professional experience in national security and intelligence issues in Washington, D.C. He held positions at the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Department of Homeland Security before joining the Federal Bureau of Investigation. While at the FBI, he also held senior roles on joint duty assignments at the National Intelligence Council and the National Counterterrorism Center, as well as work for the National Security Council under the Trump administration. Ali holds, holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of Michigan, a Juris Doctor from the University of Detroit School of Law, and a Master's of Arts in International Relations from American University. He writes and provides commentary across a number of media sites and platforms, including ABC, BBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, NPR, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Hill, and Newsweek. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ali. Kaylor, thank you uh, so much for that introduction. So I made it in time uh, from Ann Arbor this afternoon. I, uh, I left at 11 o'clock and I made it here in a couple hours and didn't get pulled over once. So uh, that, was, that was a good news um, story uh, on my part. We're really excited to be here. And it sounds like it, we've got a great program for you today. And again, I'm honored to, to be here. Um, so as Kaylor mentioned, um, now, I'm here today to hopefully uh, help kick things off and, and provide some perspectives on this topic of political extremism and violence in the United States. You know, that may not be the right term. Other people would call it uh, domestic extremism or domestic terrorism. So whatever the right term is, that's the, the subject I want to get into. And uh, the perspectives I'm going to offer are sort of blended from my uh, position over the past few years um, teaching at Michigan, which has given me a little bit more time to, to step back and, and think about not only current events, but how um, sort of current events connect to, whoops, I, I'm not on, sorry about that. Um, uh, how current events um, connect to uh, um, uh, history. And so part of my presentation will take us back um, into sort of previous decades in the country and some of what these trends look like in terms of political violence and extremism here. And then we'll fast forward to uh, more of the modern era and, and talk uh, and use a case study to talk about um, certainly a, an event here that captured not only the attention of everyone in Michigan, but the, the nation and arguably the world. And that was the plot to kidnap Governor Whitmer in October of 2020, which still uh, is not concluded from a legal perspective. And then we'll, we'll wrap up. And I really want to do get your, your um, questions and perspectives because I don't want it to, to just be me talking the whole time. Uh, I also think it's really interesting for me to be here on stage with the Howenstein Center. Um, Colonel Howenstein, his background is a military intelligence officer that I learned in preparation. So always honored to, to be in the presence of an institution that has some connection to the professional world that I was in and the intelligence Committee and also um, the, the Ford uh, Foundation. So I teach at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. So it's really nice to have these shared connections um, on stage. So with that, here's a little bit of a description about what we'll try to um, get into. Um, and then again, I, I do wanna uh, take the last 20 minutes or so um, to get your questions and perspectives and and comments. So let's um, let's uh, start um, kind of in the way back machine, going back to the the, the 1960s era, let's say, in, in the United States, a sort of a jumping off point. Um, there has been a longer history of domestic extremism or political violence in the U.S., but I think it's interesting if we start there uh, in the 60s and then kind of fast forward to to where we are now. And if you can see the the slide. Uh, uh, from where you're sitting, and it may be a little hard to read, what I tried to do is come up with this 
color schema to represent these different sort of ideological trends or um, movements that were happening in the extremism world first that were or sometimes um, occurring overseas but then having manifestations here um, but then also some uh, of these ideas and movements and, and even groups that are very unique to the United States that we haven't seen necessarily replicated in other parts of the world and that I think just speaks to the uh, diverse nature of what this threat has looked like uh, over time. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll be, the graph will be able to animate correctly and then also kind of paint some of these trends. So um, I know we're not in the Q&A section yet, but just I wanted to get um, your, your thinking caps on from a participation standpoint. So just kind of a, a poll question uh, to the audience. All you gotta do is raise your hand. How many of you kind of remember what it was like in the 19, late 1960s and the early 1970s and how divided the country was politically. Now, I will tell you, uh, I, w I was born in 1968, so I have no real recollection of what that was like. But if you, were, uh, if you were a little older, you would know. And I would argue that the country at a political level was very divided back then, uh, arguably even more so than it is now, but that those political divisions spawned a domestic extremism phenomena then that we don't see replicated now. And I think that's really fascinating that 50 plus years ago, there was a much more diverse political extremism landscape here in the US versus what it looks like today. And so that's hopefully what this, um, this graph will, will try to show. So again, I, these different colors try to align to these different groups or ideologies or movements, and, and maybe that'll, be clear as this um, as the slide starts to to animate. But if we if we look at this um, you know twenty year stretch from the sixties to the eighties, and this isn't the the totality of, of what the threat environment looked like, but just kind of broad strokes, you, there are a lot of different colors here, and I think that is a really interesting picture when you just take a step back and look at the different types of political extremists, um, either beliefs or uh, groups or ideas that were out there, and they spanned the ideological spectrum from the far right to the far left. Again, if that's the right construct to use. And so uh, maybe kind of starting at the top of the, of the chart here and kind of working our way down, I mean, there was a lot of red in that time, and the red is meant to reflect what I would consider, you know, these far left movements that were active here in the United States, but and some of these movements also either drew inspiration from sort of the, the Soviet Marxist-Leninist ideology that was certainly dominant at the time, either from a liberation movement perspective or just, um, you know, that, that perspective of, you know, the Soviet influence in the West and the Soviet Union trying to do everything they could to, to make things difficult here. So um, going back to that uh, time frame, we had you know, far left groups like the Weather Underground, if people remember that group, or, uh, and that was um, based out of the, the broader uh, student uh, protest movement that was uh, generating uh, or coming together uh, as a result of the Vietnam War. Um, but you know, Weather Underground, um, you know, driven by these um, student um, sort of extremists, and the tactics they used here domestically were sort of these classic terrorism tactics that you would see overseas. You know, bombings, attempted murders, arsons. I mean, this was, they were serious. This wasn't just um, sort of playtime for the weather underground. And, and that, it wasn't one single unified group, but the weather un underground sort of operation was active for, for several years. And several people got arrested as a result of um, the political violence that they were Engagement. So you had sort of a larger um, sort of group or a movement with the Weather Underground, and then you had a really small one, like this one called this, anyone remember the Symbionese Liberation Army? And I'll just throw the question, who was sort of the, the, the person who represented the, whatever that threat looked like from this very idiosyncratic group here? Who was that person here in the United States? Hurst. Patty Hearst, right? Exactly. She you know, got kidnapped by this group on the West Coast and they sort of brainwashed her and then she got involved in all the sort of the, the uh, illegal activities they were involved in, including, you know, that famous picture of her trying to rob the bank and she walks in with the machine gun. And so you have this really small group, but is also drawing inspiration from, you know, these Marxist, Leninist, revolutionary ideals that were out there and also engaging in 
political violence. Uh, one of the fascinating things about the Simeonese Liberation Army is that probably still to this day, the biggest urban gun battle that has been conducted here in the United States by an extremist group and law enforcement was with a shootout at a safe house in LA with four or five of these um, Simeonese Liberation Army uh, you know, activists and LAPD, and based on you know, the, the historical record, about 4,000 rounds were exchanged in this gunfight that lasted several hours, which I, I don't think we've seen anything like that in the United States since. And I believe um, the people who were sort of holed up in this safe house and shooting, shooting trying to shoot it out with LAPD, they, they died in a, a fire of, of the house. And I think that also showed their commitment to the cause. However strange it was. And then we had you know, other groups like um, you know, this one, the 19 May Communist Organization, which you know, name tells you is drawing its inspiration from the Marxist Leninist ideals that were being promoted overseas. So that was sort of the far left end of the spectrum. Um, but we also had a very active far right uh, threat in this time that was also sort of ideologically diverse. Uh, and there was no single group um, that was sort of pulling the strings in this far um, right world. So we had the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, we had uh, this really strange group, almost like a cult in Arkansas called the Covenant Sword and the Arm of the Lord. There was another organization that sort of drew on similar um, sort of white supremacist um, beliefs, but also neo-Nazi ones called the Aryan nations. And again, these were um, groups that were active in the US in the 70s and 80s that were um, just as threatening as, as the far um, left ones and using similar tactics and intent on killing people. Again, they weren't just sitting around the campfire chit-chatting about things. They were actually trying to sort of operationalize their ideas and, and their plans. So we had a far right um, threat that was, was intense. Um, and then we had other, other sort of types of, of movements and ideas to um, so the Black Liberation Army, which led into the new Black Panther movement about a decade plus later. We had um, the beginnings of sort of uh, single issue um, groups like the Animal Liberation Front uh, in the 70s, which then spawned another group called the Earth Liberation Front. A few years later, we had a Puerto Rican separatist group called the Macheteros that was also violent, took up a lot of time and resources for the FBI in this period. So, so again, in this 20 year stretch here, there, there's a lot going on in the US. And I, what I think is interesting now, people have completely forgotten is that this is what the threat environment used to look like here from domestic terrorism. Again, very intense, um, spread across this ideological spectrum, but also not geographically located to one particular part of the country and you know, pretty serious tactics and, and lethal attacks as well. But it's almost like this wasn't part of history because we don't talk about it, but this was the reality of what domestic extremism looked like uh, then. And then if we uh, move forward a little bit, um, the, the colors start to change um, and the activity starts to change. So I would argue from the late 80s to the early 2000s, um, some of that activity started to die down, partly because of arrests and disruptions and uh, FBI focus working with state and local law enforcement. Um, but there were also other things happening uh, both around the world and the country. You know, the Vietnam sort of era had, had ended. That high level of activism um, and protests had receded to a degree, but we still had threats and we still had groups. Um, the one that I am still really fascinated by, you know, here we are 40 years later, is a group called The Order, which also drew from some of these same beliefs and ideas and, and white supremacy. I wouldn't call them a neo-Nazi group, but certainly white supremacists. Anyone here ever heard of The Order before? Um, they, uh, outside of all the groups here up until this time, probably the most dangerous in the United States. Um, responsible for five murders to include a talk show host named Allen Berg in Denver, if anyone remembers that attack. And he was killed because of his Jewish identity and he was very outspoken against you know, people who 
were uh, you know, in this world of white supremacy, and they deliberately targeted him and killed him as he was pulling into his house um, uh, uh, in, in Denver, just basically shot him dead outside his car. And not only you know, were they willing to engage in these kind of you know, targeted killings, but um, they were also successful in these um, bank robberies and, and, and heists. And at one point, they had managed to accumulate about $4 million in, in 1980s money. And their, the goal uh, for the leader of, of this group was to use that money to basically spread the, the, the goals and the values of the order to a much broader pool of, of like-minded individuals in the United States. And the order was, for the most part, kind of centered in the Pacific Northwest. But the leader of this group, his goal was to make this, like really in, uh, spark a revolution inside the United States and, and sort of have this much more dangerous white supremacist movement kind of rise up. Thankfully, that didn't happen, but that was the goal. And again, they had intent, they had a little, they had some capability and they were, they wanted to do more. And much like the Simonese Liberation Army a decade prior, the order, uh, the sort of the, the core group of the order after a number of people got arrested in the aftermath of the Allen Berg murder um, were holed up in another safe house. And anyone know where Whidbey Island is? And, and off the, uh, the coast of Seattle and the state of Washington, holed up in the safe house here, there, uh, FBI agents kind of cornered them in another massive shootout um, with the FBI. And um, just like in the Simeonese Liberation Army uh, shootout uh, a decade prior, everyone died when this house caught fire and no one wanted to escape. They would rather you know, die and, and you know, stand and, and fight and, and die as the house is burning. So you know, just another indication into the mindset. Um, so that order threat was high, even though it didn't last that long. Um, but then we start to see uh, by the early 90s, you don't necessarily see um, the white supremacist neo-Nazi threat sort of coming back. And we certainly didn't see a, a significant um, element of the, of the far left, or, you know, the violent far left threat coming. But in the aftermath of, if folks remember, the standoff at Ruby Ridge in 1992 with an individual named Randy Weaver and his wife. And it was, it was, it was a, a tragic event on, on multiple levels. But this standoff between FBI and this sort of survivalist um, named Randy Weaver and his family just spiraled out of control and, and led to the unfortunate death of Randy Weaver's wife and the death of his 14-year-old son. And then just what, almost uh, six to eight months later, we had the incident at, um, in Waco, Texas with the cult of David Koresh. And again, that's probably not the outcome the FBI wanted was that compound to go up in flames and to have more than you know, 50 people die. Once again, you know, people inside a house refusing to come out would rather die inside the house, just like some of these other events, uh, once the building caught on fire. Um, but in a short amount of time, the combination of Ruby Ridge in 1992 and Waco in April 93, when the, the compound burned down, sparked an anti-government movement throughout the US and really led to the, lot, the rise of, of what we would now consider sort of these unsanctioned militia uh, groups uh, in the United States. And um, to bring it back home, I mean, we had one here in Michigan, the Michigan militia, and depending on you know, sort of scholars about the militia movement, and that's definitely not me, they would argue that when this anti-government militia movement started to, to rise up in the early 90s, uh, early to, to mid 90s, the Michigan militia was really influential at a nationwide level. Now, again, they weren't organizing to overtly overthrow the government or engage in acts of terrorism, but there were some um, foundational issues that, that were there. And you know, it wasn't just only the, the Michigan militia that was active in this time, there are lots of other uh, militia groups across the country. And um, no one really knows how many militia groups there are now inside the United States. It's not. And th this whole question of legality, is it legal to be in a self-proclaimed militia group in your state? That's, that's an interesting question. There are lots of um, you know, different uh, perspectives on that, but um, there are a couple organizations that actually try to track the known militia groups. Um, one is the Anti-Defamation League and the other is the Southern Poverty Law Center. And if their pictures are right, uh, they, you know, they put out annual assessments on this. They 
you know, their, their data shows that there are hundreds of militia groups around the country, known militia groups. Um, and again, is that an accurate depiction of, of reality? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Is everybody in a militia group expressly intent on conducting terrorist attacks or overthrowing the government? No, but again, like there's a reason why people join these groups and it doesn't take much to move from organizing as a militia to then potentially moving in a completely different direction. And we have an example of that here. And then if we um, look at where we are now, where we've come over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, again, we start to see some, some um, different sort of groupings, different timelines, some colors from the past showing up, um, but we have groups, if you uh, paid attention to news about you know, the arrests uh, coming out of the January 6th six, six investigation, of which there have now been over 1,000 people arrested by the FBI as a result of January 6th, every one of these um, circles that I put a, a, red, um, a red sort of uh, dash around, these are, people in these groups have been arrested as a result of January 6th. Now, it doesn't mean that they, you know, were, they, they came together to storm the Capitol or get involved in this insurrection, but I think it's pretty interesting when you start seeing the connections of some of these groups to at least January 6th. And again, what does that mean for, for the future of domestic extremism here? But we have um, sort of these anti-government groups like the Three Percenters, the Oath Keepers is probably the most infamous of, of all of them. Um, from a legal perspective on January 6th, the most serious um, charges that have been brought forward by the federal government are on seditious conspiracy. And the entire leadership of the Oath Keepers has been hit with these seditious conspiracy charges, which are serious felony charges. I mean, if their cases go to trial and they get charged, I mean, these are 20 year sentences for, for each charge. So um, these anti-militia groups were active in uh, January 6th, but then we had, um, you know, people associated with a group, if that's the right word, uh, you know, the Proud Boys. I don't know if uh, folks are familiar with, you know, the Proud Boys. I'm not even sure what to call the Proud Boys. Are they anti-government? Are they white supremacists? Are they neo-fascist? That's kind of a term that I came up with because I can't put them in any one of these other ideological boxes. But that's another group in which uh, several of their leaders have been hit with these seditious conspiracy charges as a result of their involvement on January 6th. And then, you know, other, other um, you know, folks uh, charged uh, as a result of January 6th. The one that I have a, probably the most struggle kind of trying to put into this framework that I've come up with is QAnon. If you're familiar with this sort of conspiracy theory known as QAnon, I myself can't even really describe the principles uh, that that uh, are baked into the conspiracy theory. But all that said, again, a number of people who are self-avowed QAnon supporters arrested and charged as a result of crimes because of January 6th. Um, and so that's another you know, interesting um, picture of where we are now. Um, but just like there were white supremacist and neo-Nazi groups in the 60s, 70s, um, into the 80s, they're still around too. Still small, still um, you know, kind of fragmented, but still very potentially dangerous. And what I find interesting about these um, sort of white supremacist neo-Nazi groups like the Adam Waffen division or the base, they're not organizing to do anything else other than just kill people. I mean, that is their principal goal. So these, these small neo-Nazi groups look like your traditional classic terrorist groups of their intent and their uh, orientation of just on violent action. And they're not really involved in trying to do uh, anything else. And um, if anyone's ever heard of the base, uh, that's another group that in my mind almost took inspiration from this group, the order. Uh, the base also took their name from Al Qaeda, which translates into the base in English. So I find it interesting that a neo-Nazi group here in the US takes their name from you know, probably the most infamous terrorist group in the world, Al-Qaeda. Al and uh, when the Governor Whitmer plot um, was being, uh, or was unfolding, at least in terms of the news, at the same time, the FBI made a couple arrests of the base um, activists here in Michigan. Uh, and at the time, there's a, a young man named, uh, I think it was Justin Watkins, uh, 
who uh, apparently was the leader of this fringy um, neo-Nazi group called the base. But again, he's in our backyard here in Michigan, and he probably was trying to figure out how to move this group into the, the next phase of, of violent action. So even you know, something as, as sinister as the base um, had, some, ha had a bit of a, a presence here. So, so this is the threat picture. And again, I think it's, it's interesting when you can take a step back and, and look at these different sort of trends and the evolution uh, and going from sort of the 60s to, to where we are now. And what this, all, what this doesn't represent are individuals who don't necessarily align themselves to any particular group or uh, ideology and sometimes can combine several of these at once, but are still motivated to act out violently on you know, behalf of a, a number of different factors. And, and that is a very difficult threat too. It's almost, I mean, the FBI and law enforcement has more tools and authorities to go after organized groups, but trying to spot the lone wolf or the lone offender, what I would you know, use that term, um, that, is a, that is much more difficult. And um, until that person is done something illegal, there's very little law enforcement or the FBI can do to, to stop them. And that's why, unfortunately, if you look at the, the modern track record of successful, uh, what I would call domestic terrorist attacks in the US over the past decade, uh, almost all the lethal ones are carried out by lone wolves and lone offenders who just fly under the radar or their behaviors aren't observed the right way or no one reports them and then they're able to go off and, and you know, murder innocent people, which is not a good news story. So that's the threat picture. And again, hopefully this um, has given you something to think about for, for the Q&A. Um, but let's, um, let's look at it um, here in our backyard too. So if we remember the, the Wolverine Watchmen uh, plot, um, the, the, the news broke about that in October of 2020. But the timeline for the, how the plot came together was probably about a year prior to the arrest. And so again, mapping out sort of the evolution of the plot, um, the different tactics that FBI and law enforcement use. It's a pretty interesting case study. Again, this is here in our backyard, not too far away um, in, the, in the Lansing area. So um, based on you know, a lot of the media reporting that, that's come out is that the group came together probably in late 2019, if not early 2020, but they came together before COVID. And so I think that is an interesting uh, insight there. And from everything that's been reported is that it appears they came together because you know a, a relatively small number of individuals, maybe a dozen, if not more, um, hard to tell kind of what the, the ideological glue was um, between them. Partly, you know, these shared anti-government beliefs, partly, you know, interest in sort of pa paramilitary activity and and you know, staunch supporters of the Second Amendment, which isn't illegal, obviously, but the group came together, you know, in this time frame. Um, and then, but I th based on what's come out in the court documents and media reporting, the thing that transitioned them from perhaps like a bunch of weekend warriors getting together to shoot and you know, perhaps trade ideas about um, what they didn't like about the government, the thing that sparked their anger and took you know, the group's uh, focus to something completely different from their, their original base come together was, was COVID. And so once the, the COVID restrictions happened here, and as we remember in Michigan, they were amongst the most intense, probably nationwide. And that sparked a lot of popular discontent. I mean, beyond the discontent, you know, we didn't, for the most part, see uh, you know, uh, plots coming together against, um, you know, politicians or elected officials. But for this group, for whatever reason, COVID was the thing that completely changed their set of beliefs and then their goals about what they wanted to do. And um, probably between late uh, or, you know, when the COVID restriction started into early March and April, a lot of what they were doing was not, was flying under the radar, wasn't detected. And the lucky break, I think, in this case was that one of those people in the original Watchmen group, um, who probably joined for a bunch of different reasons before, 
became so unnerved about what they were hearing, either in person or in these social media chats, um, that they then went to their local law enforcement agency, and it's still not clear where that was here in Michigan, and then that local law enforcement agency notified FBI Detroit, and that's how the thread got pulled on this plot. Had it not been for that one person who, again, was so uh, unnerved about what they were hearing, and even if it seemed aspirational in this spring time frame, that was the thing that got the FBI and law enforcement centered on what this group was potentially thinking about and, and doing. Um, and what I think is so interesting about the plot is that it was, um, it was, uh, it was being watched um, both internally. I mean, the FBI was starting to, to bring in some pretty um, uh, sort of sophisticated capabilities to, to, um, to understand kind of what was happening within the group, both on the, the social media side and the kind of the person to person side, but the group itself, unbeknownst to them, even though they were being watched, uh, ironically in their name as the Watchmen, um, that they went from talking about kidnapping Governor Whitmer and thinking about Governor Whitmer to taking what I, would, what I was calling concrete sort of operational steps to put this in motion. So they, they, they stopped being angry about it and then they made this decision as a group we're actually going to try and pull this off. And that was pretty shocking to see as well once you know, the, the news came out. So um, uh, sort of the, like the, the kickoff meeting where they went from brainstorming to, okay, now we're gonna put this plot in motion and here are all these different things we're gonna do was in June of 2020 at this meeting in a safe house in Dublin, Ohio. But then from there, um, they started to engage in tactical training at uh, a farm, I think one of the, the watchmen had here in Michigan. And so they were conducting, you know, how to shoot and maneuver against, uh, you know, Governor Whitmer and her security detail, which included, you know, targets uh, and, um, you know, sort of shoot houses. So, I mean, that's a pretty serious level of commitment to engage and that, um, they also, uh, even though they didn't know they were being watched when they did it, they conducted not one, but two dry runs of uh, surveillance on Governor Whitmer's second residence. I think, I don't know if it's in Traverse City, but it's certainly um, in that area, uh, her summer residence. And they literally got in cars and drove a couple hundred miles and did reconnaissance on the house to again, try to, come up with an operational plan. If we were going to, going to try to kidnap her and literally pull her out of the house, how would we do it? And that's also pretty brazen. Again, you, you've gone well beyond the aspirational stage if you're willing to do dry runs or surveillance runs against a sitting governor's second residence. Now, the good thing was the FBI and law enforcement was watching it the whole time, but again, they let that sort of play out to understand what the group was, was thinking about and I'm sure had the group gone, like had there been some red line for the FBI or you know, the Michigan State Police and all the other law enforcement agencies that were involved, I'm sure agents would have swooped in and arrested you know, everyone in their cars, but that didn't happen. Um, but again, that was another kind of pretty uh, brazen aspect to the plot. And then as the, you know, the, the, into the fall, the thing kept moving forward. They bought stun guns, because that was another part of their, their concept was to kidnap Governor Whitmer from um, her summer residence, um, literally like shock her with a stun gun, and then um, put her on a boat and have some, I mean, this sounds crazy when I say it, but this is what these guys were thinking about, and then put her on a boat in the middle of Lake Michigan or, or somewhere and like tape some kind of mock trial and then execute her right there. And that's what these guys were doing. And that's why all these little pieces were, were flowing into that. And probably, you know, by after, you know, the stun gun purchase and, and other things, there must have been some decision either at FBI headquarters, uh, and that was the environment that I worked in, in in my career, with the field office here and in collaboration with, you know, the law enforcement partners here in Michigan, where somebody must have made the decision, you know, we, we have enough evidence um, to go forward and pro try to you know, bring charges against all the people 
involved in this case, and now it's just time to make the arrest. And so, if you remember, I think it was the first week of October, October 7th or 8th, and there were multiple arrests made by a dozen or, uh, with a dozen, a dozen or so of these individuals and uh, in multiple locations, arrests here in Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin. So that must have been a pretty complex thing to pull off from the, the law enforcement side and make sure no one got hurt in the process, um, which, you know, that's always a consideration too. But the, so the plot got exposed when the arrests happened. But again, there was a much longer um, trail to it. And uh, the FBI used a lot of pretty sophisticated techniques to, to keep watch on what was happening throughout this time frame. Um, and then just kind of looking at uh, the faces of, of the, the, this isn't everybody um, who was charged, this is only 10 uh, of, the, of the 12 or 10 of the 13 or 14. But here's, here's what you know, the majority of, of, the, of the folks look like, you know, just kind of regular average guys. Um, I think the youngest was in his early 20s and the oldest was in his mid to late 40s. Um, and, uh, you know, different sort of backgrounds. Um, uh, some had military experience, some, some didn't. So there was no sort of single common background or denominator that, that um, you know, you could, you could find across all of them. But then as um, over the, the past year or so, as the legal proceedings have unfolded against everyone charged, there's been some interesting results. So, um, Six of the 14 people charged were uh, charged with federal crimes, and that's what the left slide of the uh, left side of the slide tries to show. And then um, the other batch had been charged with Michigan crimes, and this is this is really interesting. Of the people who were charged with federal crimes, the word terrorism doesn't show up in their charging documents at all because there's no crime of domestic. Terrorism. There's other federal crimes you could be charged with, and that's where some of these people got hit with those conspiracy, kidnapping of a you know, government official. Um, a couple of people were facing weapons charges too, but the word terrorism doesn't show up, even though I would argue everything I just described looks like an act of terrorism to me, um, politically and ideologically motivated violence. And on the Michigan charges, even though all these trials are still, they, they still haven't... Um, uh, uh, started, um, and who knows, some people may roll the dice and try to go to trial, somebody may um, take a plea deal, although that hasn't happened yet on the state charge, the word terrorism does show up because Michigan has its own anti-terrorism statute and uh, Dana Nessel, who's the Attorney General, decided to employ some of those terrorism specific charges against uh, the, the people hit on the Michigan um, side of, you know, the, the legal side for, for charges. So we'll see how that plays out, whether the terrorism language in the Michigan trials make a difference in terms of, you know, the, um, you know, the results or the sentences, but we don't know how that's going to play out because, again, no one's trial has started here. And on the federal side, two of the six um, pled guilty. They were the first two, actually, of the six to, to have their legal... Um, fate determined, and you know, there must have been a conversation with the U.S. Attorney's Office for a lesser charge or sentence, you know, you know you'll, you can, um, you know, we, we, you'll still be found guilty, uh, but uh, the, the sentence won't be as long. So two of the six pled, and then the other four, um, two were found not guilty on all charges. Then the other two, there was sort of a hung trial um, where the jury couldn't um, make a decision on the first trial. And that was an interesting kind of moment where you've got two pled guilty, two found not guilty. And then uh, there was some thought, would, would the Department of Justice try to retry the two people who had, uh, had that sort of hung jury or would they um, just kind of walk away? And interestingly, um, the two that were initially found or that had the hung jury um, results, uh, Barry Croft and Adam Fox, who are two of the, the principals in this plot. Um, that's uh, Barry Croft right there. Um, on the second, on the retrial, were found guilty. So, you know, different legal outcome uh, here as well. And then uh, looking at um, sort of where we're going to go in the future on this. Again, there's no answer. There's no there's no right answer here. 
But if I've just described kind of what the, you know, the past and the current looks like in terms of domestic extremism, here I think are a number of different factors that are going to shape this threat into the future. And it's really hard, even for someone like me who thinks about this and studies it all day long, like which one of these factors will be the most prominent, which is the one that we're sort of weakest on from a uh, sort of a policy perspective, you know, where do we need to kind of build out more capabilities and authorities? And I'm, I still struggle with coming up with the answers here. But I think uh, in total, all these factors at some level are going to shape what the future of this threat looks like here in the United States. So will we see more on the far right end of the spectrum, which I would argue that's what we've seen over the past you know, 10 to 15 years? Will we see a resurgence of the far left kind of extremism that we saw in the 60s and 70s? Maybe we will, maybe we won't, based on how some of these factors play out. Or will there be other types of beliefs and ideas that, that uh, emerge that we haven't even detected yet that will also make a difference uh, when it comes to extremism here? So, so maybe that's a good, um, good point to, to end on. And, and now I'll uh, open it up to, uh, to questions and comments. All right, guys, don't make me call on you because uh, I'm not tracking participation like I, I do in my classes, but uh, hopefully I've given you enough to, to come up with some perspectives. Um, you didn't speak to the relative sizes of these groups uh, initially. Are, um, you, you mentioned a few that were very small, right. but um, so and you had Antifa up there, um, and how does uh, because there's such a sort of a not really organized exactly. Uh, it's just sort of a it's uh, a movement. Yeah. It's, right. uh, could you speak to you know the sort of the 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 sizes of some of these groups? How how large they are? How many um, adherents they had? Yeah. So that's a great question. And uh, again, I think this this notion of you know kind of trying to bound things by by just scope or size can can give you some answers or, or perhaps not. So um, just like there's this broad sort of diversity ideologically, again, you know, different ends of the spectrum, I think it's the same, at least when you look at the, the formal groups. Some are big, some are small, some aren't even groups. Like Antifa, I would argue, is not a group. It is an ideological movement. QAnon is certainly not a group. Uh, it is a movement. But there may be hundreds of thousands of people or not more in the US who actually believe in these conspiracy theories and a much smaller number who are willing to act out violently on them. But you, I wouldn't call QAnon a group much the way I wouldn't call Antifa a, a group. But how many people believe in, again, the, the goals and the beliefs of, of Antifa? Prob it's probably a significant number. It may not be as many as QAnon, but it's probably um, you know, in the hundreds, if not thousands, around the country. My I'm not an expert on Antifa, but my understanding is they they organize um, kind of at a local level in chapters. But just because you organize as a chapter doesn't mean you're willing to engage in violence. So they, I think that becomes more individualized uh, uh, in in some of these circumstances. No, you're talking. Hi. Um, can you flip back to the screen that had your, I don't know, 15 or however many Im um, items that were going to impact? Oh, yep. There you go. Because I was scanning that and looking, and I didn't see economics or financial duress. It's, don't um, miss that? Yeah, you know what? I probably left it off intentionally. And again, as someone who has tried to get into the minds of extremists, both on the international side, on the domestic side, one thing that seems to be pretty common, no matter, again, whether you're looking at the overseas end of the, the threat or the domestic one here, economics generally don't drive people to political violence, at least at a broad strokes level. Like, you, there are always outliers to that general caveat, but, um, you know, in almost every example you can think of, the socioeconomic status of an individual is, is not predictive at all whether they're going to go down that path of political extremism or violent action. And if anything, what I find quite interesting is, um, depending on, again, what group or threat you look at, that 
they almost tend to be represented by sort of an upper class kind of mentality. That was certainly the case, uh, or you know, you know, highly educated um, kind of socioeconomic status. That was the case in the far left here in the United States in the in the 60s and 70s. Because again, that came out of the student protest movement across you know campuses, um, and then. Now again, this is not domestic terrorism, but you know, look at a group like Al Qaeda and the people who formed Al Qaeda going back to Afghanistan in the the eighties. I mean, these are all the elite of Arab uh, sort of society coming together in a distant place like Afghanistan to fight the Soviet Union. Economics had nothing to do with you know their motivation to to come together then, and then you know once they changed to more of an anti-U.S orientation, but Osama bin Laden was the son of a construction billionaire from Saudi Arabia, and his deputy, Ayman al-Zawahiri, was an Egyptian doctor, right? So these are people who are highly educated, have you know, walked away from these lives where they could have been incredibly successful in doing something else and something more positive for society, but they chose a completely different path. And I could, you know, could give you another terrorist group and come up with the same um, you know, set of circumstances. So, and from what I've seen, you know, socioeconomic status tends not to be a driver most of the time. Okay, we have a point of disagreement. So, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Yep, absolutely. Professor Ali, thank you very much for such a, an interesting presentation. I have a question. There's always been the debate about American exceptionalism. And it's a notion that's often debunked. However, with your very rich and interesting topic, I wonder if there is a sense in which America in some sense, some sense is exceptional in the modern world with regard to the uh, terrorism that we experience in this country uh, all across the political spectrum. Your comments, please. So by except, just help me unpack the question a little bit. By exceptionalism, what, what are you trying to, to get at there? That, we're, that our phenomenon isn't as sort of dangerous as acute as it is in other places, or is there something you know, just unique to the threat here versus, versus other countries? Yes, it's strictly a question. I'm not coming at it with a preconceived answer. I'm going back to the Tocquevillian sense that America is in some sense exceptional and uh, compared to countries in the Eastern Hemisphere, right. for example. So I'm asking you, is, is the range of the, the ideological spectrum of terrorism in our country, the intensity of it, the, do, are we a, a bellwether of terrorist movements around the world? In what sense might we be exceptional? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, now that I understand it better. Um, I think it depends sometimes, depending on where we are in history and what's happening in the world uh, around us. I would argue um, that uh, certainly contrasting the, like the domestic terrorism phenomena here versus how it's manifesting in Europe. It's, it seems worse in Europe than it is here. Far broader in scale and, and far more sort of entrenched. And our European partners are really struggling with how to combat it because they're smaller than we are and they don't have as many resources as, as we do to, to tackle it. Um, but there, I, you know, I could go up and down the line of European countries that seem to have a, like just even on the far right end of the spectrum, have it worse than we do. Germany seems to be like almost a first amongst equals uh, in that perspective to the point where, and this is a crazy example when you think about it, um, Germany, again, much smaller military than ours, um, but still you know, a strong partner. And they have a very focused special operations capability called the, there's a company size, uh, uh, or maybe you know, a little bit bigger, brigade size special operations element called the KSK, which we have partnered with uh, around the world in various missions. Anyways, um, through a German you know, domestic security investigation, and this has all been reported in the news, they had to disband an entire company of these highly trained KSK operators because all of them were neo-Nazi sympathizers and extremists. So you think about it, like they had to basically eliminate a capability within their own military because it had been so seeded with this really pernicious ideology. How that happened, I mean, that didn't happen overnight, probably happened over time. So that to me is like a clear example of 
how this can look in another country. We don't have, I mean, we have probably individuals within the military over time who also, you know, fed into the, some of these, but we haven't had to disband platoons and companies and, you know, higher level military units be, because of that kind of threat. So, yeah, I think we're, we're doing better than some of our European partners, but it doesn't mean that the threat is zero, zero here, like I described. That's a great question, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Ali, uh, I missed the beginning of your talk. I uh, was held up, but uh, I thought the part I heard was excellent. And um, so Americans today get so much information from media, and many people uh, like to watch one cable news network or another, obviously. And do you think it's possible, given the media climate and threats from the right and the left that you mentioned here, that people get the whole picture. I mean, if you know, certain networks might downplay or ignore threats from the other side, and maybe. So uh, in this fractured media environment, do you think it's possible to get like big overview of the whole thing? Yeah, it's another really good question. Um, yeah, I do think there is probably some, you know, uh, I think I've got on here, I have social media, but not sort of mainstream media. But yes, there, there is probably some amplification of these ideas or beliefs or the threat in the media landscape. And again, how does that play out when it comes to the people thinking about then violent action? Uh, you know, in some ways, like the more attention you put on something, the more perhaps, um, you know, you'll, you'll manifest a threat out of uh, out of that, and I myself, like I am in the media all the time, providing commentary on these types of issues, and I have to think carefully sometimes about: is it the right moment for me to say something, and am I just fanning the flames of that are going to lead to you know these grievances down the line, or you know can I just give a completely you know neutral and objective perspective and, and help kind of tamp things down? That's that's what I try to do when I engage in kind of the media commentary. Whether that happens or not, you know, I, I don't know. But yes, I th do think, you know, sort of the, the media role in this is significant, but is it the most significant amongst all these other factors? It's empirically really um, hard to, to know that. Uh, and in addition to the kind of the role of the media, then, you know, the, how, do you, how do you gauge political rhetoric as well? Like how much, how much value is there in heightened or you know loud political rhetoric in animating people to political violence? Um, you know maybe some of that played out on January sixth because I have to believe that not everybody who stormed the Capitol was intent on doing that um, until you know they got to to D.C. that day. You know there were clearly people who were. Uh, thinking about engaging in doing something before, and that's where these seditious conspiracy charges come in. But the overwhelming you know, majority of people who've even been charged and arrested on January 6th have been, it happened more organically, right? And so again, I think there could be something to, for, from a rhetorical perspective. Um, there was another really interesting case study um, last summer, if people remember, uh, in the aftermath of all the media attention on the document search on uh, President Trump's house uh, or residence in Mar-a-Lago and you know, all this classified material that they found there, uh, that there was an individual who apparently was so angered by you know, what the FBI was doing or all the attention that was being put on President Trump that um, tried to attack the Cincinnati FBI field office. Like in the universe of bad ideas, that's, that's up there, right? I mean, that's a suicide mission. And I don't say this unjust, he got killed in a shootout with law enforcement, but that shows you how people can just get blinded by anger in the moment. And that person was probably already on some pathway to being radicalized. And for whatever reason, you know, the Trump Mar-a-Lago search tipped him over the edge, but he was brazen enough, if that's the right word, to try to attack an FBI field office. And he lost his life as a result of that. And again, that's the climate we're in, where it's either the media attention or you know all these other factors, and then you know something happens, and then people just snap, and then you know they'll try to do something. But trying to find that lone wolf or that sole you know lone offender in the run up, it's really hard. We have time for one final question. Thank you for this talk, Professor. One of the things that I it's helpful for me to have takeaways. So my takeaways, and I want you to correct me if I'm off target here, 
is that things are not as dangerous as they were in the 60s or 70s, and I do remember those days. Um, we seem to be more splintered with these kinds of activities and groups than the 60s and 70s. There's just more of them across a wider uh, continuum and more diverse. And that we don't seem to be, based on questions asked and answered, not as bad as other nations. You didn't spend a lot of time on that, but you know this is pretty depressing. So <laughs> I just I just want to make sure that we right. you know we remember that part. Um, and yet, one of the things that I, f I found really interesting was that gap between the '90s and the 2010s, and that's when internet hit. And I was thinking about the order and how successful they might have been right. had they had the internet, because that in turn t makes more noise, confusion, and agitation where people can't even think about things and really get to the point of thoughtful uh, discernment and understanding and a sense of calm, if you will. That's a really good observation about this. Like there, isn't all, there aren't a lot of colors in this right. almost 10, 15 year time frame. I have a, a potential answer that whether I'm right or wrong, you know, that's, that's up for debate. But I think the reason why we didn't see a lot of domestic ex terrorism or extremism here in this, period of time because of 9-11. And the, the US national security focus, I mean, swung so hard on the Al-Qaeda threat overseas. This, and I think for people who are, you know, on various ends of this ideological spectrum here in the United States, they must have seen that response. This is what we were willing to do against extremist groups overseas. You'd be nuts to stick your head up now and try to pull off a plot or you know, give law enforcement a reason to go after. It didn't mean that there weren't you know, threats, but just so much lower on the domestic side than the international side. And again, you know, there have been a lot of people who say that was a mistake. Like we took our eye off the ball of domestic extremism in that 10 or 15 year time frame after 9-11 because in a way it looks like this now because we weren't paying attention to it back then. I mean, that's a fair criticism. But as someone who was in that world from 2002 to 2018, all I can tell you is that, you know, the Al Qaeda threat and then the ISIS threat overseas looked so dangerous to the country that, and they were trying to pull off attacks and plots that were so different in scale and scope than, you know, the single lone wolf trying to conduct an attack here. Doesn't mean that it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was the right thing to do. But again, you have to prioritize on the threat that's in front of you and the thing that you think can do the most harm. And certainly when I was in government over that stretch, yeah, we were hyper-focused on international terrorism. But at the same time, now we have this resurgence and we gotta figure out a way to kind of get to the right balance between the two. But that was a great question and observation, so thank you. All right, caller, are we, are we out of time? We are, let's give a round of applause. Well, thank you guys so much.